before I open in prayer, uh, actually, a, a, I'm going to ask Paul Stanley to read chapter 8 out loud for us, but not at the moment. Wait until I make my other announcements. Okay, so we're going to read the scriptures in just a moment. But uh, in chapter 7, we had the um, 144,000 uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel, Jewish men, and in chapter 11, we'll be uh, reacquainted with them as those who are uh, exceptional and, and pure and so on. Uh, this is from uh, chosen, the Chosen People's uh, newsletter, and it's talking about discipling young adults. And what they're talking about here are those Jewish young people who have embraced Jesus as the Messiah. Today, the Messianic youth in Israel are bolder, more confident, and more direct about their faith than ever before. They are open and willing to talk about their faith in Yeshua, in their schools, and into their military years. It takes courage, faith, and understanding to be willing to risk uh, what they work so hard to obtain and every person needs, acceptance and belonging. Praise God for supportive communities solid teaching and the growth of the body of Yeshua in the land, that is Israel. So I thought this is happening today and when the church is gone and all believers in the world are gone, the 144,000 show up and they're going to have a message and it's going to be a powerful message uh, to the world and uh, this is happening right now. So. Uh, just saying that at the time it's going to be more exceptional. And just to bring you up to speed on the world, uh, this is a magazine, I'm not going to tell you what it is because I don't like it, but I got it free. So, uh, Berlin, there was a plot to restore the German Reich, the Third Reich. Yay! Lima, they let uh, an 85 year old president out of, out of prison because he has uh, cancer and he was going to die anyway. But there's still two more former presidents in prison in, uh, in Lima. So, uh, in Ghana, there is a uh, mystery candidate. A masked man has entered the race to become Ghana's next president, and nobody knows who he is. <laughs> Literally, you can't see it, but that's a billboard, and the guy's standing there with a suit and a mask. So, uh, in Moscow, uh, Navalny is missing. Who's Navalny? Well, he's the guy that spoke the truth, and then they tried to kill him with poison, and he didn't die. So they went to prison, and you go to prison to see him, and nobody knows where he is. So he's disappeared. Uh, let's see, uh, other things. Uh, Uganda, an anthrax outbreak. Yay. And I'm going to close with this. In Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, for the first time in three decades of climate summits. You excited? The nations of the world have approved a global pact that explicitly calls for transitioning away from fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal. This quote from Wopke Hoekstra, the EU Climate Commission. Humanity has finally done what is long, long, long overdue. So don't you feel better? <laughs> no. I wanted that as an uh, introduction to uh, the uh, seven trumpets. <laughs> because no matter what humanity does, God supersedes. But I just concluded my sermon, so let's close in prayer. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Paul, would you please uh, read Revelation chapter 8 for us, and then we'll open in prayer. Let's, uh, Revelation chapter 8. Please. Okay. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God 
out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burned up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld, and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe! to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices for the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. All right, you may be seated. I thought you better read it and then pray because <laughs> you want some good news? Chapter 8 ain't good news. <laughs> Father, we're grateful that uh, you've given us your word and you've given us the future and we can see it and we can prepare ourselves uh, for the future today so as we open these words and these uh, sentences and paragraphs guide and direct us and help us to see clearly what is impending we commit this time to you in Jesus name Amen. Amen. so that begins with the trumpets. Well, it begins actually in verse 1 where the seventh seal is open. Remember the scroll, the book, was, was uh, taken and Jesus is been, has been opening the seals. We had the interlude in chapter 7. Uh, in a sense, I suppose, it's like a breath of fresh air amidst all the causticness of the first six seals. Well, now the seventh seal is opened, and there's, a, there's silence in the heaven. Now, remember that word silence, because we all understand what silence is. See? We all understand what silence is. And th it's fascinating to me that... <clears throat> John, in heaven, and in a sense, time is, quote-unquote, irrelevant, yet it's so important for John to have recorded that there was silence for about a half an hour. And, and just, you know, we could sit here, and I could quit speaking in, a, uh, in 30 minutes. Um, we all just sit here and silently wait. That would be the equivalent of what John is, is doing. And, you know, if, if, he's, if he's looking around, uh, you know, sometimes there will be a, 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 a pause in something and you kind of go like, oh, I sure wish the speaker would speak because it needs to get up and get this thing going. You know, we don't want to be here till tomorrow. But why is there, why is there silence. I believe that the uh, silence is there <clears throat> to prepare for the awful consequences of the seven trumpet judgments which are going to be happening as soon as the 30 minutes is over. 
So, silence. You want to catch everyone's attention. Stop what you're saying for a moment and they'll think there's something important coming out of your mouth. <laughs> So was there something important coming? Yes, we see in verse 2, And I saw seven angels who stand before God, and there was given to them seven trumpets. Now there's a whole discussion, which I'm only going to allude to, that there's a whole discussion that these are the archangels, and that would include, of course, Gabriel and the others, which have names in certain things, but not in the scriptures. Um, but I believe that uh, this just tells us that this is their commission. These seven angels were the ones commissioned to receive the trumpets and basically hold on to them until the time for them to blow came to be. So that's what we see in, in verse 2. We see seven angels and they've received their trumpets and now they're waiting for the signal. We are introduced in verse 3 to another angel. This angel came and stood at the altar, and he has a golden censer. Um, the censer is that container that uh, burns incense. Uh, we've had a discussion on the altar and the throne and the temple but I don't really expect you to have remembered all the, that discussion, so I will quickly reiterate to you that in the tabernacle, uh, down here was the Holy of Holies, and right next to the Holy of Holies was the altar of incense. The, burnt, the, the altar of burnt offering was out here. When it mentions the altar in the book of the Revelation, my conclusion is that it's the one... It's the altar of incense, which is a golden altar, and it sits right outside the Holy of Holies in order for the wafting of the specified smells to waft to heaven so that whatever is wafting is acceptable to God. I don't know why specifically God wants that or designed it, but that's what it is. So that's where I leave it. So what is this angel? He came, he stood at the altar, which would be the altar of incense. And he has a golden censer. Okay, so what do we do with that? And there was given to him much incense, that he shall give it to the prayers of all the saints upon the altar, uh, all the saints upon the altar, the gold one, that is, uh, the one before the throne. He was given... Who gave it to him? We can only assume, because it's passive, and there's no one really higher to give it to him than God, so God gives him the incense. And what is that going to do? I find it fascinating the way it is written that he was standing there, and he was given the incense that he should give it to the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. What are the saints praying, or what did they pray? Well, I'm sure, as uh, so often the case in mature believers, we, play, we pray for justice. We pray for God to do what is righteous in these people's uh, hearts and minds. There's certain people, I won't name names in California, who make ungodly, anti-biblical, anti-God, uh, political choices and then foist it upon us. They do that. And I have a difficult time when I pray for these people. I have a difficult time. Of course, I have to end up praying that they will bow the knee before truth, that is, him. Um, but I don't ask a blessing upon them at all. I do not. So what are these prayers? I believe that these prayers are the prayers of those who are persecuted, those who wish to see God honored uh, during this time of tribulation. And uh, will that happen? Well, you can go back to Thessalonians and read how the Antichrist will abolish anything that is worshipped in this world today. 
So nothing but him can be worshipped, period. That's, that's the way it goes. So um, these people are praying for God's justice. Uh, but it's interesting. It says, um, and there was given to him much incense um, in order that he will give to the prayers of all the saints. And I, I have to run through that in my mind because the saints are praying and just from, and I didn't, I couldn't find anybody that addressed it, so I'm telling you just what I think this is, that there is something divine here uh, given to facilitate the prayers. And God approves that. So you kind of go, wow, I'm not sure I understand it. Well, that's fine. I've been through this and I don't understand it. But the, the, the people are praying and God supplies even that which is missing. And I think I get that because uh, oftentimes even when I pray for you, I don't always know how to pray for you. So I pray for you, and I think, oh, okay, Lord, I don't know how he's doing today, so do what you're going to do, <laughs> or something else. But I like this statement from Robert L. Thomas, and it makes us appreciate the whole matter of prayer. The interaction between the sovereignty of God and the prayers of his people is part of the ultimate mystery of existence. The saints pray for justice and the prayers play a part, but it is God's business to determine the time and the nature of actions against their persecutors. So, did I answer the question on how our prayers interact with God's plan? I don't think I can. Are they important? Yes. Do they matter? Yes. How does it work? I don't know. We pray. God hears. And you've heard it before. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes he, uh, my version, hey, I'm going to get to that in my time. So just be patient, okay? You could say it shorter. But how does that work? I don't know. But God is sovereign. And here we have this angel facilitating by God's design and with God's approval, <clears throat> the prayers going up, and they seem to matter. Verse 4, And there went up the smoke of the incense for the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel before God. The prayers for the saints. It's a dative. So it's, it's, it's a, particip a participation with the, with the prayers, with the people praying. It's... It's a part of it, and yet the influence or the entity is from the outside. The incense is from the angel who it was given to him in order to give to them. I don't know how it works, but it seems like God is filling in all the blank spaces. So if you think your prayers are insufficient, just talk to God about it. And I think he has the ability to fill in the blanks. So the title of this was The Seventh Seal Broken, Trumpets Distributed, and then I added something for me <coughs> because there wasn't room in the title. Uh, and an angel prepares fulfillment for answered prayers. So that's verses 2, 3, 4. And then in verse 5, this angel, which is involved in the facilitation of the answered prayer, I think there's a transition here in verse 5, and the angel uh, took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. So how do you say, let the games begin, on your mark, get set, go? Uh, I believe that that's what this is. And with that, then, we find the peel, peals of thunder, and then the next word is phone, and it can be easily translated voices or sounds. And uh, sounds just seem to work better. 
So they're followed with the censer being thrown to the earth, uh, the fire from that altar, the peals of thunder, the sounds, the flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. I think, and I, I, it's all through the scripture, and I have not taken the time to check it out, but in your scripture reading, whenever you read about God showing up or uh, there's some sort of judgment, these thunders and lightnings seem to be a precursor to God's arrival. Remember the uh, time, if you're reading through the scriptures, and this past week you read uh, how the children of Israel showed up at Mount Sinai, and uh, God is on Mount Sinai, and he said, hey, Moses, get the people together. I want to talk to them. And, of course, there's thunders and lightnings and the earthquake, and it's like, uh, I think God is here, and I think I'm afraid. <laughs> so this is a preparation for God's arrival, so to speak. Only in this case, it's not God's presence. Rather, it's his uh, essence of wrath upon man's um, rejection of him. We move on to verse 6, and we have the, uh, the seven angels, uh, the ones who uh, had the, the, the seven trumpets. They, they made themselves ready to trumpet. And... Uh, there are certain images that come to mind on these angels. I, I kind of picture them all in a row um, in the movies, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. There's a time when all the elves are lined up and they all pull up their bows, but it's like, it's like one of these marching things. He pulls it up and then him and him and him and him. And it's just fascinating to watch where this whole group pulls up their trumpets. Well, I think these guys are all lined up, and they're all sitting there with their trumpets ready. And we find that uh, they're ready to sound. And so in verse 7, we find that they begin. The first, the first uh, angel sounded, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And there's going to be a result of that at the end of verse Seven, But this hail and the fire mixed with blood, if you go back and read when uh, God was judging Egypt before the children of Israel left, uh, God judged and one of the judgments was hail. And it's a fascinating read because the hail was there and there was uh, fire mixed um, among it. And I honestly, I don't think I've ever seen fire and hail together. I've seen hail and I've seen fire, but never this. Um, so it's a fascinating thing, and yet we saw it in the Old Testament when Egypt was being judged, and we see it here when the earth is being judged. So they were cast to the earth, the hail, <clears throat> and a third of the earth was burnt up. <clears throat> I... Uh, the word burnt up, we understand, um, it, the word by itself simply means to be consumed by fire. And so I translate it as fire consumed. It was fire consumed. It was burnt up. Uh, crispy critter type. So a third of the earth was burnt up, and a third of the trees was burnt up, and all the green herbage uh, was burnt up. Uh, so the result of the first trumpet, there is a destructive power in this plague. The fire burns a significant portion of the earth's vegetation. <clears throat> and that's partly why in these uh, first four trumpets I wanted to read what the world is so excited about, uh, putting the skids on earth's um, uh, warming, which is cyclical, uh, it's a cyclical thing but they want to put the skids on it. Um, and they're all excited that humanity is finally doing what it ought to do. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. God is going to burn up here. Just here he's going to burn up one third. We have a second angel. The second trumpet sounded. And uh, something like 
uh, as a mountain burning with fire. It does not say it is a mountain. It says something as like a mountain, uh, a great mountain burning with fire. And where did it go? It was went into the sea. And the sea is not specific. I think that's the sea generally, the waters of the, of the world. And a third of the sea became blood. Is that literal blood or the color of blood? It doesn't say the color of blood. It says blood. Have we seen that before? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I thought we saw that in the plagues of Egypt as well. You know, you have your fresh water, you start pouring out your cup of coffee, and it's not coffee, it's blood. It's like, ah! That's disgusting. Have we seen this before? Yes. If you believe the Old Testament, we've seen it before. Do we see it here? We see it here. So a third of the sea became blood. How does that work? I don't know. And a third of the creatures of the sea, those that had life, became putrescent. To, to say they died is accurate, but the word is broader than that. And it's actually, because we've all seen dead fish floating in the harbor, you know, belly up. Um, this would be almost instantaneous, not just belly up, but uh, things floating. It's, it's disgusting. And a third of the ships was destroyed. So there's something major that takes place here. And what is it? Well, it splashes down this something like a mountain. And it splashes down into the ocean waters. And one third of the sea creatures die and are uh, die. And as a result, as well as one third of the shipping. Now, all of us remember COVID things. And one of the things that COVID gave us was a bunch of shipping lined up out in the harbors waiting for people to show up to unpack it. And of course, there was other things that didn't ship at all because nobody was packing on the other side. And that was with all the shipping intact. So when one third of the shipping of the world is destroyed, you have a loss of life, you have loss of property, you have loss of livelihood, you have loss of the environment, you have loss of trade. You can imagine, and I, I didn't check how much of the shipping around the world uh, with regards to COVID, how much came to a screeching halt, 95%, 50%, 25%, I don't know. But we do know that 33 and a third percent of ships will no longer ship from anywhere. So there's, there's economy, there's a lot of things involved in this, there's the poisoning of the seas. Again, we can complain about the plastics piling up in various places around the world, uh, which I'm not saying is a good thing, uh, but in one fell swoop, uh, this is all going to take place. We move on to the third uh, trumpet, and if you thought the burning up of the stuff in uh, the first trumpet was bad, and you thought that the uh, mountain, uh, as something as a mountain coming down in the second trumpet was bad, we get to the third angel. The third angel trumpeted, and there fell out of the, uh, of the heaven a great star burning as a torch, and it fell, interestingly enough, on a third of the rivers and upon the uh, springs of the waters. Now this word springs is the source springs. It's, uh, I almost call it headwaters. Uh, which headwaters affect everything down below, of course. So how does this uh, probably, probably a meteor, probably, uh, because a great burning uh, astra uh, as a torch, we, we kind of see that with the shooting stars, which are meteors, and they're gone. Um, this one would be much bigger, obviously. How, and I can't answer it, how does it affect a third? I tried to run through and I did not check if anybody knows which uh, continent in the world has the most 
lakes slash rivers. I mean, the United, the North America has a lot, the mighty Mississippi. Africa has a lot, but more. Um, I don't know of all the rivers in Asia. So, but I figure just mentally because I didn't do the uh, behind the scenes uh, comparisons. This is going to land on a continent, and it's going to affect uh, all these, all the the, the fresh water in, in that continent. That's an opinion, uh, unprovable at this point, but nevertheless, I, uh, that's what I say. The name of this particular uh, star was translated as Wormwood. The uh, actual Greek, Greek is uh, Absintha, which nobody says Absintha. I don't, can't even say it accurately when I'm reading it. So we just call it Wormwood. And a third of the waters became Wormwood or, or bitter. And many of the people died uh, from the waters because the waters were made bitter. So when this comes down, it's not so much going to say that the rivers will not flow and the lakes will not exist, but that they will exist in a, in a different form. And if you uh, want a fresh cup of water, you're not going to get it from, from there. Finally, we get to the fourth angel. He trumpeted. And there was struck um, smitten. It, it's a difficult word. Uh, strike, hit. And there was hit a third part of the sun and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars so that they were made dark. A third of them was made dark. And so they did not shine for a third part of the day and the night the same way. Now, how does that work? Because just even uh, Astronomy 101, the Earth does this. Actually, the Earth, oh my, does this <laughs> around the sun. Um, and it turns a certain speed. So I don't know how a third of the day is gone unless things are speeding up. Ooh. Uh, I don't know how that works. But the atmosphere will be impacted. The heavens will be impacted. Entities will be obscured. And the foundation of our daily routine, that is day and night, are changed. So, how much does man control this? Man can do what he wants, but God even changes the whole 24-hour system of day and night. How does that work? I don't know. This remains a mystery to me. And uh, I just think it's toward the end of, uh, toward the, toward the end of the tribulation. All right, so we get to the conclusion, and you say, <laughs> thank you. Well, here's the conclusion, verse 13. And I looked, and I heard one eagle in the midair, saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to those dwelling upon the earth because of the rest of the blasts of the trumpets of the three angels about to trumpet. So this conclusion, uh, which is, of course, the conclusion for today, but it's like, you, you think that was bad? Just wait. I mean, it's kind of like Job. Hey, your, uh, your sheep are dead. Uh, hey, your camels are dead. Uh, oh, your cattle are dead. Uh, oh, your horses are dead. Uh, oh, your kids are dead. Uh. Hmm. Does it get better? doesn't get better. So the conclusion of chapter 8 is, hold on, but there's more. And it's all bad news. You know, I, I thought, okay, really, I probably should have preached through the, uh, the 
next trumpets, but you know, between time and how much time it just took me to get these 13 verses under my belt, and then try to make sure I presented something as close to <coughs> truth and accuracy as I possibly could. There's no way, but the um, the fifth and sixth trumpets, I don't even know, I don't think I can get through the fifth and sixth trumpets. I think we'll get through the fifth one next week, uh, and the sixth the following week, but does God have a plan? Yes. And if we were in Philippians, or Colossians, or Ephesians, or Romans, or 1 Corinthians, we could say, yes, and this is God's plan. Let me just tell you that none of that has changed. He still wants us to follow Him, and obey Him, and share Him, and live for Him, and honor Him, and do those things which we did yesterday for Him, today, and plan to do those tomorrow, as long as God gives us strength and health and wealth to, uh, to honor Him and live for Him day by day. So all these things we're looking at to say what I've said before, we will not be here. This isn't for us. This isn't about us. The church is gone. This is God's wrath being poured out upon this earth and the ones dwelling upon this earth. And it is no holds barred. But, and I'll close with this, if you want to read something semi-fun about the day of the Lord, Joel chapter 2, but in the middle of Joel chapter 2, God says, but wait, if you repent and follow me, who knows? Maybe God will postpone all this stuff. That doesn't relate to Revelation, but what it does relate to is in our day, in our days of living for Him. It doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done. It's where we're at now and what we're going to do with what we know. So as always, bow the knee to the Lord and commit your way to Him. Father, we are so grateful for Your, uh, your grace which was extended to us by your mercy you chose us, by your grace you died for us, by your uh, righteousness you have declared us to be so. We are so grateful for all these beautiful things. And we're so grateful that you have destined us for salvation. You have destined us to be with you. That's why we exist. And you've made so many promises to us. Father, may we appreciate these promises day by day and may we be willing to follow closely after you and to recognize the beautiful and amazing grace that you have extended to us. So bless us for having been here. May we be challenged uh, to uh, continue to know your truth and to warn others of the impending um, truth that's coming. In the meantime, give us what we need to serve you well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.